the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. I'll give you a ride. Now what I'm about to tell you is true if you want to hear it. I do want to hear it. You do want to hear it, then I'll tell you. The Extraordinary is the night a dead man played Good Samaritan to actor Telly Savalas on a lonely highway. It is the dark secret behind an ancient Aboriginal legend of a young girl who avenges her lost love in this tropical jungle pool. The legend continues in the 90s. Death toll, 11. It's an unusually high amount of people or number of people to be drowned or to be accidentally killed in any area, yes. It is the supernatural appearance of this wartime airman in a photograph taken three days after his death. He would undoubtedly have been in the photograph if he hadn't died. And there he was. The extraordinary is the eerie, super-intelligent conspiracy of these killer whales to plan and execute a premeditated hit on a trainer they didn't like. It is the unexplained phenomenon of a young woman legally blind since birth who can see with perfect clarity when this Stanford University doctor puts her under hypnosis. Could you look at me and describe what you see? He's a big man. A big man? You not have here, here. That's right. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on the extraordinary. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. Man went in search of his place in the universe recently. The NASA space program, with bases in Australia, began an intense probe of outer space to look for other living beings. In its first minute, a futuristic microwave scanner searched for life more deeply than all the combined efforts of mankind in all of history. Yet while this epic pursuit of the unknown excites our imagination, there remain endless, unexplained events here on Earth in our daily lives. The secret to one of them lies deep within the rainforests of the far northern tropics of Australia. The water in this pool is cold, yet this is the tropics. The beautiful Babinda Valley just south of Cairns in northern Queensland, where the air is very humid and hot. Anywhere else along this valley, the water is warm. But here in this pool, it's cold. Cold like death. It's called the Devil's Pool, and we're about to learn why. In January 1991, the Devil's Pool claimed the life of a young Melbourne man, just turned 20. Somehow he slipped on these rocks, lost his balance, and went into the cold water, never to come out alive. A tragic story in itself, but barely the beginning of the sad mystery hidden deep in the Devil's Pool. Young John Albert Pucci was possibly the 14th victim to be claimed by the apparently harmless still water in this idyllic place hidden among tropical peaks and valleys of Queensland's Misty Mountains. The previous victim was a German woman, a tourist in her 40s. This follows the disappearance of a 45-year-old West German woman. This she was drawn into the Devil's Pool in May 1989 and never came out. The woman apparently wandered away, but was witnessed falling into the Babinda Creek from the top of a waterfall. Since the deaths began to be recorded in 1934, every other life claimed was that of a young man. And that may be the clue to the real and deadly secret of the Devil's Pool. A legend that dates back through untold generations of the Indinji Aboriginal tribe, who've inhabited these northern tropics for centuries. No member of the Yindinji tribe will go near the Devil's Pool because of the legend. 
And the only tribal member chosen to pass on its history is this woman, Annie Wonga, as her mother passed it on to her. A long time ago, along the creek and valley, at Yedindi tribe lived. In this tribe was the Walder called Waranu. And Waranu was promised... Because of Waranu's age and wisdom, he was promised the hand of the youngest and most beautiful maiden in the tribe, Olana. They were married, but not long after the ceremony, their valley home was visited by another tribe. And in this tribe, there was a handsome young man, and his name was Daiga. And Daiga and Olana, they fell in love. Unable to stay apart, Olana and Daiga began meeting secretly. On one occasion, they went into the valley and camped together beside a stream. A terrible risk since the leaders of both tribes would wreak harsh punishment if they were caught. And according to the legend, it was here near the Devil's Pool that the young lover's story would come to its abrupt and tragic end. A legend was about to be born. The wandering tribes began to miss them. So they went searching for them. And as they, as they found them, the wandering tribe took Daiga away. And the, our tribe held Olana. Olana, realising she had lost her true love and that she could never return to her tribe, threw herself into the water. Lana's spirit is still there and she calls to any wandering young man who happens to pass by. Beware young men not to walk in, not to go near the devil's pool. Has the legend of the boulders and the devil's pool become reality? Over the past 34 years, official records show that 11 people have died in this remote place. Locals put the number at closer to 14. It's significant that most of those to lose their lives have been young men, aged in their late teens or early 20s. That of those to die, only one has been a woman, the German tourist in 1989. Even Sergeant Max Luxton can't explain the pool's treachery. It's an unusually high amount of people or number of people to be drowned or to be accidentally killed in any area, yes. A haunting record of the power of the Devil's Pool is this photograph. In it, two people stand peacefully gazing into the serene waters. Yet only seconds later, Nicholas Wills and his girlfriend were swept off the rocks and into the raging waters. Waters that almost appeared from nowhere. The water just rose about five feet in about five seconds, which was rather scary. And uh, then we saw uh, a young man float down stream, uh, be uh, swept into the top of the chute area, go underwater and not come up. The local librarian, Holly Gorris, took this photograph. Tragically, it would be the last time the 20-year-old man would be seen alive. His girlfriend was luckier. We hope that there won't be any further, but because of the uh, high rate that we've experienced so far, I, I suspect that there will be other deaths in the area. And to add to the mystery is this. This photograph taken by a tourist made headlines in northern Queensland. Look carefully. Could it be the face of this man who was claimed by the Devil's Pool only days before? And there is one more thing that adds to the questions about this deceptively beautiful place. Some people believe that the deaths of the Devil's Pool have been caused by the icy cold water. Even on this scorching hot day in shallow water, the temperature is a chilling eight degrees Celsius. It's a very, very low temperature, the water there. In fact, the body that was in there five weeks wasn't uh, deteriorated very much at all. It was in very, very good shape considering the time that it had been in there. Perhaps the icy cold water is to blame. Perhaps the power of the legend is too strong. Either way, locals have considered putting the legend of the Devil's Pool to rest. Even though it's a place of beauty, it's a place of danger, and the number of fatalities over the year to me, over the years, to me means they should just forget that it's there and perhaps fence it up and in fact we had a scheme going once where we were going to blow it quite high and uh, uh, dynamite the place so that it would be less dangerous. Up to 14 lives lost in one small pool over more than 30 years is fact. The legend of the Devil's Pool is part of Aboriginal folklore. The mysterious anguished cries from Alana for her lover remain a chilling warning for those who visit the Misty Mountains.
Just an old tribal myth, maybe. But I can tell you it's very hot up here in the misty mountains this time of year. Any other time or any other place, I'd welcome the chance to dive into the cool waters of a pool like this. But not today. Not here. We listen to bizarre and supernatural stories told by friends and strangers maybe with a little grain of salt. But now and then, someone so prominent we can't ignore comes forward, as in this story. It happened on Long Island, New York, to a very famous man. Now, what I'm about to tell you is true, if you want to hear it. I do want to hear you it. You do want to hear it, then I'll tell you. I was never superstitious. I'll give you a ride. But then something happened in my life which scared the hell out of me. And for something like that to happen to me is something that I can't understand to this day. God knows how many years ago. Let me think now. 58, 59. It's a lot of years ago. Now, I just left off a date. Beautiful young girls since left us. And it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going home to Long Island after dropping her off. And as would happen, I ran out of gas. And uh, I go into this White Castle restaurant. I says, is there a gas station open? He says, yeah. He says, you walk through the woods there. He says, get on the, the, the Grand Central Parkway, take it to the Cross Island Parkway. He says, and the gas station there open all night. OK. So I am start walking through the woods, a wooded area, not the woods, going up. And as I'm doing that, I hear a voice say, I'll give you a ride. I turn around, and there's this guy in the Cadillac. And I didn't hear the Cadillac. You hear the voice, and uh, what do you see? I see a guy in a white suit, and uh, I hear an effeminate voice. He say, I'll give you a lift. I said, that's very nice. I said, I'm going to a gas station. <laughs> if we get to the gas station, talking very nice and uh, I'm f fumbling around in my pockets and he says I'll lend you a dollar well I didn't ask him for money and the truth is I was broke and I says well look I says uh, you know I've worked for the State Department and uh, well anyway give me your name and address all right allow me to mail it to you because I'm very embarrassed anyway I go there I get a can pay for the gas we start driving back to my car to put the gas in the car. And I thought that was very nice of him. And then in the clear blue sky, he says, I know, I'm not going to mention the name, I know so-and-so. And it's a baseball player. We weren't talking baseball. Oh, I said, who's he? He says, well, he's a utility infielder for the Boston Red Sox. Oh, it's so bizarre that he would say it in the spookiest voice I ever heard. He kept driving, get to my car, put the gasoline in. He pushes me to get it started, pushes me to get it started. My car starts. I thank him very much. All in all, it's a very lovely experience to meet someone to help you out like that. No incident whatsoever. Go home, go to work in the morning, get out in the afternoon, this headline in the then Journal American. So-and-so, dead. The guy he mentioned in that very spooky voice, aged 20-some-odd young ball player, under very mysterious circumstances. Um, autopsy and all that stuff. I said, God, what a frightening coincidence. I go home and I says, hey, Ma, isn't that funny? My mother, I think, was part witch. I explained it to her. She says, well, yeah, tell me strange things that do happen. I said, but, but, but. And then I remembered that he gave me a piece of paper for me to send a buck to. And I look at it, and there, besides the address, is a telephone number. OK. Pick it up, and I call the number. Jimmy's Bar. Oh, I said, well, can I speak to Mr. Cullen, please? Oh, Mr. Cullen, just a minute. Woman gets on the phone. Who's calling? Hi, hi. May I speak to Mr. Cullen, please?
He's not here. Well, when do you expect him? Who is this? I says, well, I, I was with Mr. Cullen last night. He gave me this telephone number, and he said I could reach him here. She says... Look, you son of a bitch. I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about my husband, and he's been dead for two years. <laughs> anyway, I wouldn't let it go. I did get in touch with the woman again. I did meet her in New York. She came down from Boston. Because, you know, this is a little too much. The clothes I described were the clothes he was buried in. The piece of paper that he gave me sound, signed James Cullen. She brought a letter that he wrote her when he was in the army. It had Jimmy on that. Outside of that, the signature is identical. There was only one thing that was different. I said uh, he had a high voice. She said, oh, no, 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 she said. He had a deep voice like yours. Oh, then it meant he killed himself. This way, right through the voice. Box, whatever. Anyway, this story happened to a guy like me, and as I say, it's been haunting me now close to 40 years. Telly told us, by the way, that he'd always been a cynic about the supernatural until that night. <laughs> Coming up, the story of two killer whales and how for a week they devised an intricate plot of almost human intelligence to attack one of their traders. Margot has been legally blind since birth, but under hypnosis of a Stanford University doctor, a miracle. You would pick up this book about Yeah, I'm books. sorry, I didn't have uh, sports This is one of them I'm supposed to read. Yeah, yeah see, that's why I don't know. There's something you should know about one of the men in this World War I photo. He was killed three days before the picture was taken. Once you've seen it and, and knew the face, it was unmistakable. You know, if you pause and look around you, really look around you. There are mysteries almost everywhere that we easily pass over during our normal daily lives. But watch a flock of birds weaving and turning in unison in the sky. Perfect synchronicity that says they have some instant communication system we don't understand. Same with a school of fish in the sea. How do they know to turn at exactly the right moment? From Los Angeles, Rafael Abramovitz, with a story about the incredible communication between the largest dolphins of the sea, the killer whales, and the day they applied their unique intelligence to a conspiracy against man. The killer whale, his beauty and precision is equaled only by his mystery. If the shark is the perfect killing machine, the killer whale is its worst nightmare. With cunning and brute force, he devours sharks, other whales, and anything else in his path. He has no predators and no equal. The killer whale's brain is the largest on Earth, and his intelligence is far beyond any other creature that swims. He's of the dolphin family, and dolphins are to their ocean neighbors what man is to other animals on land. They have an intellect and language sophistication that are light years ahead of all else in the sea and far beyond most creatures that walk. Man's science is yet to fully understand the extent of their intelligence, and we can only wonder at an underwater communication system of vocal and or telepathic signals that defy our understanding. Australian marine behaviorist Steve Arnott. When you're in the depths of the ocean, they can actually talk to each other over great distances. Whether it's telepathic or whether it's actually just sound waves, researchers believe that dolphins and maybe orcas can actually send pictures to each other. Uh, it's mind pictures. It is important to know these things as we enter the story. 
It is about an incident that took place not long ago at the famous tourist attraction in San Diego called SeaWorld. Something very eerie happened. Actually, a series of very eerie things happened which culminated in this dramatic scene caught on videotape. Notice how the killer whale emerging from the water first seems to pause in midair, rolls to his right, and comes down mightily on the trainer riding the other whale. These are precision animals. They can do this act a thousand times a year with their eyes closed. They don't make mistakes like that. The meat in this sandwich was John Sillick. To this day, Sillick looks back on five years of unanswered questions. The 16,000 pound orky left him with a broken back, ribs and pelvis, two broken legs and internal injuries. Why did the perfect performer miss? Or did he hit his mark that day? As with most human crimes, the clues lie buried somewhere in the past. And we have to look for a reason, a motive. To find it, we have to go back several months earlier to another tourist attraction, one called Marineland, further north in California in Palos Verdes, a park that has since closed down. It was in Marineland that the greatest bull killer whale of our time once performed. He was called Orky. Please join with Marineland's trainers as Orky and Corky share with you a close-up look at the killer whale. Orky performed with his female mate, Corky. And for 20 years, they were the superstars on which Marineland built its name. The killer whale Orky and his mate had a husband and wife relationship. While Orky was fearsomely dominant, he was also ferociously protective of Corky. Their baby, born some years earlier, had fallen fatally ill soon after birth. It refused to eat, and both Orky and Corky showed visible signs of grief. It's significant to the story that in its final hour, the baby was taken away in a sling, never to return. The trainer, Gail Lawley, would speak of the closeness of the parents after the tragedy. You know, it was, it was a nice thing about them. I mean, he was a very dominant animal, but he also took care of her. Marineland liked them, and they seemed to be content in Marineland. But then one day in 1987, Marineland was sold, bought out by a competitor, and suddenly closed down. Life was about to change drastically for Orky and Corky. They would be removed from their tank and shipped south to San Diego, SeaWorld. To do that, they would have to be separated, and the trainers responsible for doing that were understandably nervous. The chances of there being a separation problem, if you will, when they are separated, of course, is very high. As they videotaped the removal that night, a strange calm seemed to come over Orky. He didn't fight. And he swam right up into the stretcher, and then he laid there. If Orky resented the disruption, he was keeping it within. Perhaps he was trying to reassure his mate. In fact, it was the female, Corky, who cut loose that night. Corky is just flipping out. She's trying to swim into the stretcher with him. She's going nuts. And he started doing a vocal that I've never heard before. Finally, Corky would submit, and the transfer would eventually be achieved. Meanwhile, down in SeaWorld, other killer whales were about to have their world intruded upon. They were the five females, two of them stars named Kandu and Shamu. They were the split-second performers who drew a million or so people to the park every year. In a few days, the arrival of Orky and Corky would change not only the housing arrangements for killer whales in SeaWorld, but the relationship structure of all the whales involved. From the moment Orky and his mate were installed in their tanks beside the show arena, the tension grew. Trainer Jonathan Smith had sensed it. There was times I, that Shamu and Candy would go sit in front of the gate, you know, and watch Orky and Corky and Namu through the gate. And, you know, Orky being a male whale, I think sparked those two females' interest uh, greatly. 
during the performances, there was more unfamiliar vocalizing between the whales. Something wasn't normal in the relationship between killer whale and killer whale, and between killer whale and man. Sometimes underwater, when you were underwater, you could hear them vocalizing, and I'm sure maybe they were talking with each other. And then, during a performance a few weeks after Orky and Corky's arrival, it happened. Jonathan Smith was the first target, attacked first by one whale, and then the attack was joined by a second. The attackers were Kandu and Shaman. And I got to the surface, and then uh, one hit me very hard from the side. It was like a, being hit by a train. And then I was dragged right back down to the bottom, and the other one joined in about halfway down. And uh, then they let me go again. I popped back up, and then they came, both came right back over me. One grabbed me around my legs, and one grabbed me around my uh, chest and upper torso. Smith was rushed by ambulance to the hospital with a critically lacerated liver and severe internal injuries. He was lucky to live. The trainers hoped it was an isolated incident, but it was just the beginning of a tense and dangerous period at SeaWorld. Aggressive behavior by whales continued through the summer, and then they escalated. There was the near-tragic hit on trainer Joanne Weber. There were no less than 14 incidents of aggression between August and mid-November. Then came November 21st. That was the day the greatest of all the bull killer whales, Orky, apparently could no longer contain the summer of his discontent. The victim was trainer John Sillick. When Orky finally made his move, it had all the timing and cohesion of a meticulously planned ballet, a choreographed maneuver that blended so seamlessly into the act that nobody in the audience that day believed he had seen anything other than a tragic accident. Orky uh, came out of the water in a breach formation. Uh, in an in a unusual spot, in an, in an unusual way. And he simply just came down on top of me. Yet to execute with the precision seen on his videotape, the trainers and expert dolphin behaviorists agreed this killer whale needed more than angry opportunism. He needed the cooperation of the partner in his act. He needed communication, a signal, a preconceived plan, inspired by something buried somewhere in the past. In human legal terms, it's called premeditation. If only the eyes could see deeply enough. If we could look clearly into the secrets of the human mind and understand its true potential, its great untapped capacity to fathom, to imagine, to create. If man could only use the mind to its full potential, he might come to understand a mystery that's far greater than any of the unknowns in our universe. And we might better be able to come to grips with the phenomenal story of a blind woman named Margot. Born with severe tissue damage, she has lived most of her life in darkness. But her problems run deeper. Now, how are they related? Hmm? Are they sisters? Or are you all parts of the same person? Don't be silly. It can't be that. No, it can be that. You can all be aspects of the same person. All pieces of Sybil. No, no. We're all people. You can see us. Like the woman in the movie Sybil, she suffers from a condition known as multiple personality disorder. According to psychiatrists, it is a condition often triggered by excessive physical abuse in childhood, where a person subconsciously forms separate personalities to distance themselves from pain and trauma. The only explanation that I have is that 
the different parts of me, the different personalities and the different names came about to handle traumatic life events that I otherwise would not have been able to handle or deal with. Margot, the predominant personality of this interview, was actually born Diana 36 years ago. But Margot has taken over as the core personality. She has been diagnosed as having 68 personalities, all with different names, ages and abilities. Throughout this interview, you will see her change from a sweet 16-year-old Margot to Jackie, a tough 21-year-old, to Corey, a four-year-old who can neither read nor write. And as you will see, not all of these people are blind. For the most part, we will be speaking with Margot. Her vision is 2400. The state of California classifies that as legally blind. Where a person with perfect vision can see something 400 feet away, she must be 20 feet away to see that same image. In simple terms, she can't see her own face in the mirror. Her blindness can't be helped by glasses. It was as a blind girl that she sought treatment at Stanford University outside San Francisco. There she would meet with acclaimed psychotherapist, David Spiegel. First of all, there's no question that there is real damage to her vision. That is, you can see that her eyes do not move conjugately. They don't, they, you know, they don't track together. She has this resting nystagmus of her eyes where they move rapidly back and forth. And that's something that a, a normal person just can't do. They can't sustain this back and forth eye movement uh, for very long at all. So we know that she had some kind of injury when she was in her mother's uterus or uh, during birth that left her with a rather severe visual handicap. We watched as Dr. Spiegel gave Margot an eye exam. Me, for example, what can you make out about me? Well, my guess would be that there's a person sitting there because of the shape, but other than you're speaking, I wouldn't know whether you were a male or female. I'm not sure, oh, I'm not sure. Margot tested legally blind, but then she changed into the four-year-old Corey. Um, someone else needs to call Corey out. Okay. All right, good. Well, why don't we do that now? Okay. All right, Corey, I'd like to speak with you if I could, please. Corey. Corey. Hi, Corey. Hi. Do you remember me, Corey? Yeah. Yeah? Do you know who I am? Where me be? Where you be? Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Spiegel, and you're in my office now at Stanford Medical Center. As we see next, little Corey has good vision. Could you look at me and describe what you see? You be the big man. A big man? And you not have hair here. That's right. That's right. What else do you, do you have? Notice? Eyes to be the the color of your shirt. What color is that? Mm, be the color of the sky. The color of the sky. That's right. Okay. Can I talk to Margot again, please? Oh, <laughs> my poor foot. <laughs> How are you? Okay. Other than my foot. <laughs> what happened? Your foot fell asleep. Oh, I think she must have been sitting on it. Oh, oh it hurts, huh? Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> How are you feeling? Okay. <clears throat> Do you remember what just happened? No. Though Margot is unaware of time and content when other personalities surface, she has an understanding of their existence and abilities. My world is very foggy and very blurry and their worlds tend to be very clear and concise. Uh, all the handwritings differ marginally, as well as voices. So it's not, it doesn't seem strange to me that the visual acuity would change as well. I'm convinced that as she normally functions, um, she needs a seeing eye dog and she, she can't see. Margot's personality shifts can be induced through hypnosis or automatically triggered, sometimes in the middle of a conversation. Still, the whole situation is not easy to comprehend. It's easy to be skeptical. Some people are skeptics and, you know, maybe, maybe they will never accept it, but it's true, it, it is a real disorder. And <laughs> there are many others. 
just like my mom out there, and they don't even know it. Margot's 14-year-old son, Sean, sits by his mother and talks with our producer, Dan Hardy. Sean's love for his mother is a very special story. He is unfazed by any of her 68 personalities. Why don't you bring Jackie out? She's a nice person. Jackie, Jackie, I need to talk to you. Come on out, Jackie. Jackie, I need to talk to you, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi. You know what's going on? Have you been watching? I uh, talked to Meg. She said that there were going to be some people here with a camera. Yeah. Well, here they are. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm 21. Mm. I consider myself the defender of the tribe. What color eyes do I have? Blue. Definitely blue. Yeah. What color shirt? Uh, kind of a dark green, army green. Do you know about everybody else that's in the tribe? N no, I don't know everybody. <laughs> everybody is a long list. Oh, really? Yeah. How long is that list? 68 last time I looked. Who's the guy next to you here? This is Sean, Diane's son. How's he? He's a real cool kid. We wish to thank the following people for their expertise, time, and individual support. I mean, there's got to be people out there with doubts. I'm sure there'll be skeptics and I don't blame them. I can't say that I wouldn't be a skeptic if I were on the other end. All I know is what is real for me and the treatment that I've had and how much that has helped and what a difference that's made in my life. Corey, come on out, Corey. Corey. Perhaps the most touching part of this story is Sean's relationship with his mother. Tell me about the day-to-day -day life living with this lady to your left. Well, um, sometimes it's not this lady on my left, sometimes it's somebody else, but I get used to it after a while. It's something may change from day to day. Maybe she's not around for a week and somebody else is or a few others are. And it's just like a normal life, basically. I mean, to me, that's the way I picture it. Yeah, they're not gonna hurt you, it's okay. They're just filming you. Sean's parents are divorced and his mother thinks his father should get custody. But Sean doesn't want out. He wants to stay with his mother, no matter what personality she takes on. It, I guess my mom's my inspiration, you know. I want to get her back, and I want her to see this over with, you know, as soon as possible. But I, again, this is a long process to, you know, help clear up, and I'm, I accept that. I think he's wonderful, and if I think it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be doing as well as all of us are doing without Chung's aid and assistance at times, and love. Want a hug? In the middle of life's crises, when all about us is chaotic and our perception of reality is warped by the horror of war or great catastrophe, it's easy to miss even a dramatic moment in time. One of those moments was caught in a photograph during the worst hours of World War I, and it has led to one of the great unexplained mysteries in Bobby Capel's long life. Alison Holloway in London has tracked down that photograph and that moment. In 1918, a young man was killed. Nothing unusual in that. During the Great War, they were dropping like flies. But the death of Freddie Jackson shocked the airbase where he was stationed and had an everlasting impact on a young woman serving there. Not that she was madly in love with him. Indeed, she hardly knew Freddie. But his face haunts her even today, 75 years on. This is her story. We were very sad when we heard he had died, because it was one of a group. I suppose it was the comradeship. We were all a very, the transport yard was very much a sort of, I suppose you might almost say a clique. 
This was Bobby Cable's extended family in 1918, the men and women of the transport yard at Cranwell in Lincolnshire. I had a job of going round to the officers' mess every morning in my tender, which was then rather like a Land Rover now, they looked like. And I was to take any officers who wanted to go into Sleaford, which was the local town. And a blue jacket used to come out and say, Liberty boat alongside, so anybody for the shore. Friendship blossomed. Then one day, just before the unit was disbanded, it was decided there should be a group photograph, a souvenir of their time together, something to keep forever. I remember us all getting very smart and speak and span to be photographed. But there was someone missing in the lineup, a young mechanic called Freddie Jackson. Freddie had died only days earlier, though not at the hands of the enemy. Rather, it was said he had walked into a propeller. His would be the one face missing from the photograph. We all said we wanted a copy, and we were handed our copies. And there was quite a gasp of surprise because this um, young man who had been in the transport yard and had been away on leave and had died appeared in the top row, quite recognisable to us all. To the right and behind the shoulder of the man wearing the hat is Freddie's face. He's got no hat on. Everybody else has got a hat on, and he's quite obviously just his hair. So he's different from the rest. Once you've seen it and, and knew the face, it was unmistakable. He would undoubtedly have been in the photograph if he hadn't died. And there he was. I think we all thought it was exceedingly spooky. It was very eerie to us, this man who we'd known in the transport yard, appearing so clearly when we knew he was dead. And this was um, a tremendous shock in a way. It's been a very definite memory in my mind all my life. And I'm glad I've kept the photograph. I suppose this made one think pretty carefully about it. But I've, I had a sister who saw ghosts who I certainly couldn't disbelieve. So I have no reason not to believe in ghosts. I don't think I've ever, well, I can say I've never seen one myself, but I suppose looking at this photograph I have. Well, that's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. And as we go, listen to the subject of one of the other stories in our next show. Popular radio and TV personality Doug Mulray, in a far more sombre mood than we normally see him, tells his true story of a ghost. I don't remember her moving her feet. I don't remember her walking per se, I just remember the image, like a, almost like a photographic image of a person who was fluid. I mean, definitely, it was not a static image. She, she sort of turned as she moved across the room, but just for one or two seconds was there before my eyes and then gone. The reality, the single reality that dominates my memory of the experience is this spectre and it was there and it was real and it confounds everything I believe. Mm -hmm.